local government uh, and that it was uh, expecting to produce a white paper on uh, devolvement, further devolvement of, of local government functions. Um, and as time has gone on and as we've got nearer to uh, uh, this, this document coming out, uh, expectations have risen uh, and the word has slipped out, whether it's le conscious leaks or just uh, speculation, I don't know, but that it was likely to favour unitary local government in the remaining areas of the country that uh, are currently in two-tier. So it's relevant to Worcestershire, if that, if that message is true, you know, we could see uh, reforms in this country which would sweep away Worcester City Council, Malvern Hills Council, Wire Forest, Bromsgrove, Redditch um, and Witchhaven, those are the six uh, district councils, sweep away the county council and, and put in place either a new unitary county-wide authority for the whole of Worcestershire, single county unitary, or perhaps two or three unitaries, so bigger than the districts but smaller than the, the county. We don't know, uh, and of course that's just talking about Worcestershire, the same white paper is addressing the whole country's uh, remaining um, county district areas. So we can only speculate what, what the white paper will say. It has been, clearly the, the publication date has been put back already at least once, um, probably twice, I think, from what I've gathered. Um, and almost certainly I would suggest this reflects the hot politics that pretty well always accompanies discussions about reorganisation of local government. I think it often comes from good-minded civil servants who like a nice tidy map of England, Wales and Scotland and everything, you know, working in the same sort of way, good, efficient and simple. Um, that's where these things often start from, uh, but the closer you get to that being published documents, the more nervous politicians tend to get because this is often about, uh, you know, their chance of, of being in a position of influence and power. So we shouldn't be surprised that it's uh, it still stays within government at the moment. Um, uh, but as I say, the uh, the word is that the the white paper, as so far drafted, tends to favour unitary authorities for the whole country, um, rather than the two tier system that we've we've grown used to. And that's of course how it is in in Wales and has been for quite a while now, and in Scotland and Northern Ireland for that matter. And Northern Ireland's obviously a little bit different with, with Stormont and a set of districts, but that's all there is, Stormont, well there's Westminster on top as well of course, but Stormont and, and then districts. Wales has uh, unitary authorities, but also has community councils below it at the very local level. And likewise Scotland has uh, unitary authorities and community councils underneath it. So. You know, I think one important point to make early on is that the pattern in England, you know, is the exception really to the rest of the United Kingdom uh, in that we have this mosaic, papuri, mess, call it what you want, uh, but certainly diverse uh, local government structure, which I think it's fair to say is the consequence of piecemeal reorganisations over, over quite a period of time. Um, there are... Um, from, from recollection, 26 areas like Worcestershire that are sort of um, county areas but have two tiers, uh, a non-metropolitan district, shire level and, and a single county over, overseeing it. Um, but, you know, given that I think all but two of those 26 counties are under conservative control at the moment, the two exceptions being uh, Nottinghamshire and Oxfordshire, neither of which has got overall control at all, so they're you know, in the balance. Uh, you can understand why local government conservatives, you know, are very nervous about uh, any reform proposals. They've, uh, they're in a good position now. Uh, they have a lot to lose, potentially. Um, I'm actually one of those people who's, who's old enough uh, to remember, only just, but I re remember the last comprehensive local government reorganisation in England. Um, 
and uh, I think, well, I think it was in the UK actually, but it, the Redcliffe Maud report was a commission actually back in 1969. Uh, I was still at school for that, but 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 following on from the Redcliffe Maud commission, um, which reported in 1969, uh, I think it started in 68, um, led to a comprehensive reorganisation of local government. The last one that addressed the whole country in one sweep and indeed the first one since about 1860 so you know we don't do those big reorganizations too often but I do remember Redcliffe Maud and the arguments that you know poured out after it the debates that took place just like they're beginning to happen again locally here um, there was indeed a dissenting report to Redcliffe Maud. There were one of the members, called Derek Senior, I don't know if he's still alive or not, um, wrote his own minority report. So it was that controversial at the time. I think there were six members of the Redcliffe Court Commission, uh, and five of them were at, at comfortable with their conclusions, but one didn't. So it wasn't absolutely uh, in the bag. But actually, the Labour government at the time. We're now, you know, sort of uh, late 69, 1970, um, did accept all its recommendations. Um, but in 1970, we had a general election, you may remember, the Conservatives won uh, and they stopped the rollout of, of Redcliffe Maud's unitary authorities uh, pretty quickly. Um, and they, they did it by uh, essentially... Uh, establishing a, a slightly different the word unitary authority was there uh, but not universally there um, so it was a sort of new two-tier system uh, what Redcliffe Maud had been after um, as I say the Labour government of the time accepted it was a sort of city region so you know you could imagine Worcester City as being the, 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 the centre but having a sort of T territory around it of, of you know more rural and more uh, you know suburban um, so the idea that local authorities covered a, both a, an urban and a, a rural area uh, and were able therefore to do strategic functions like highways and education because they were big units uh, but dominated by you know a city so the, the idea of city regions was really what the original concept was was all about. Anyway, that didn't really happen because, as I say, the Conservatives uh, put it off. Um, some areas were created. Um, on the, well, the, the whole of local government was reorganised in 1972, the Local Government Act, but some were done on a unitary basis and others were done on a two-tier basis. So it was a bit of a, uh, a mixed match. And ever since then, there's been more occasional piecemeal reorganisations. Um, you may remember in 1986, the Met Counties, which were part of this sort of piecemeal 1972 structure, there was two, two tiers in the sense that it would be uh, metropolitan counties, uh, the whole of the West Midlands, for example, and then below that, Dudley and Birmingham and Wolverhampton and Walsall and Coventry and so on, the, the sort of Met districts. Um, but then Mrs Thatcher abolished those in 86 and the GLC with it. Um, same thing, the London boroughs and the GLC were like a sort of two-tier structure. Um, because she, I don't think she cared for the politics of some of these leaders. Um, <clears throat> But we've had a, a succession of small additions to the pile of unitary authorities. Uh, another 46 were created in the 1990s uh, in about three different time periods. Um, Herefordshire being, being one of those, for example, a unitary authority of, is the county of Herefordshire. Um, and there were further changes in the early 2000s. Um, again, several counties. Um, and their districts were, were made into unitary counties. So it's it's been a sort of piecemeal addition to the list. Um, there are now, I believe, 55 unitary areas um, and 26 two-tier, remaining two tiers. So Worcestershire is one of 26. Um, and there are, uh, you know, that's, that's where we've got to really. The map has, has become very complex. 
We shouldn't forget in all this that there's another tier of local government. Um, there are more than 9,000 town and parish councils, um, which you know should be considered as very much part of the framework of local government. We don't hear so much about those, sadly, uh, and more to say in a minute perhaps about them, but uh, you know that that's that's that that level of governance uh, has been with us all ever since 1972 when they they were created previously there were rural district councils and urban district councils um, but parish government really sort of was re-established formally um, in in 1972 um, and also these days of course we've got another sort of tier um, known as combined authorities uh, are we familiar with those uh, these are the places with mayors uh, sort of groups of, uh, of metropolitan councils that are working together with a high level strategic leadership from a mayor's office but hang on 10 combined or authorities but actually only eight of them have a mayor two of them uh, northeast Newcastle area and West Yorkshire declined to have a mayor. You had a, a, a vote, a ballot on um, a mayoral appointment uh, and both of those declined to do that. So more complexity, more uh, messiness, if you like, in that the, above the unitary structure or the two-tier structure, we've increasingly been looking towards combined authorities. Um, and you may remember Tony Blair's government were very keen on, on more mayoral systems and they rewrote a lot of the framework for governance of local authorities, really to try and push that. Um, not with great success, there was not much enthusiasm for it. Uh, so I, I would say, like it or not, uh, we have a very complex structure in England uh, compared, say, with, with Wales and, and Scotland, where the Welsh office, uh, Welsh Assembly, and the Scottish office, the Scottish government, uh, legislated to create a, a standard system across their countries. I don't remember hearing much debate or opposition about it. It happened quickly, and you don't hear very much about it uh, even now. So I would say, by all the signs, their, their unitary structures work, work well. One of the arguments that's always stated for, for unitaries, and, and I, I can see this myself as a councillor, um, is that they solve the public problem of who does what, which is, you know, a problem often for local government officers too. Um, you know, sometimes they have to get the files out and see who, who's responsible for very minute little issues, street signage and so on. And the, the world of local government is full of complexities about who does what. Um, uh, and I've been a councillor, as, as Louis said, since uh, district councillor since uh, 2000. And I still get a bit confused about who does gullies and who does street cleaning. It sort of seems like the same, but they're not. The county is the only person who can, or the only authority that can lift a, a gully, you know, the, the iron top um, and, and, and suck the gubbins out. But it's the districts that run over it and probably push all the stuff into the gully uh, with their sweepers. Um, so the, the idea of unitary authorities simply giving us one authority and they do everything obviously is, is superficially at least quite an attractive idea. Um, second point I suppose I would say that usually associates with unitaries is, is unitaries are generally more local and therefore closer to their, their communities um, because they're usually smaller. Now we do, we do have, and I've mentioned it already, we do have quite a few examples of county-wide unitaries. Uh, one of the consultancies I did from Birmingham quite a few years ago now uh, was in the county of Durham, which had certainly six, probably had about eight, I think, district councils as well as county council, uh, just, uh, just like Worcestershire really. Um, the districts commissioned me to, to review their local government structure. Uh, obviously their interest was to try and overtake the county services and, and create unitary authorities. And that that's ex illustrates the sort of climate we've been in ever since 1972, where, well, particularly in the 80s and 90s, 
where local authorities have been able to argue and present their proposals to government and government has generally been prepared to listen. Uh, so we've had this piecemeal develop further simply because of a sort of bidding process. Um, in fact, I, I could see when I was doing the, the work up in, in County Durham that the uh, the chief executive of the then county council, the old county council, knew what he wanted. He wanted a county-wide structure and he was going to get it at all costs. So whilst we recommended some, you know, what we thought was best, having uh, listened to all shades of opinion and so on, I wasn't at all surprised when I learned that uh, county wins because counties can pull strings uh, rather more effectively often than, than shire districts, you know, strength in, in numbers and all that. Uh, so on the whole, where the county has wanted unitary status, it has happened. Um, and the districts have been, you know, struggled to, uh, to hold their own. Where districts have got together um, and, and sort of plotted a, a, a unitary, they have been more successful. Dorset's a good example of that. Um, so, you know, this, this issue about the public's misunderstanding of who does what and, and the idea that unitaries are usually more local, I think are two quite potentially quite powerful things in, in their favour. Uh, who would, who has much to do with Redditch and Bromsgrove and Wire Forest? Where is Wire Forest? Many people in Maltham would say, you know, I know where Kidderminster is, but, but what, what's the Wire Forest? Um, and so on and so on. Um, the argument against uh, unitaries has always been, on the other hand, that they're really too small to be strategic and, and to be efficient, you know, to, to really do a job cheaply, you know, win, win a big contract and do, do the whole job. You need a, it needs to be a big contract and that means a, a big area of highways to maintain or whatever. Um, or to do strategic things, to think about housing development and, you know, where... where movement will take place and so on again you need a, a big blank canvas it's it's said um here here we you know we might as well think a little bit about the you know what have been the major services in local government uh and how they've, they've changed housing was always one of the more local services so district councils have always had housing but of course as we know many authorities most authorities uh, shed their housing function they, they pass their, their housing off in, into the uh, registered social landlord sector the uh, housing associations uh, there are relatively few local authorities that do housing in the way they used to still can but um, Malvern for, for example certainly said goodbye to it and Worcester too um, education when I was uh, started my career at Birmingham with one of the conferences we did every year was for the chief education officers and these were the grand folk of, of county local government they were really high high profile and, and high, highly respected uh, academic individuals that headed a huge department which linked directly down into the schools so it was really very much running an education service but all that's gone you know, we don't talk the word education in local government at County Hall anymore. It's called children's services. Um, they do still do admissions for schools uh, and they are sort of interested in the results, but I suspect that's historical. They just got used to seeing what the A-level results look like this year and taking a few uh, you know, stabs in the ribs from the opposition about it and so on. Um, but actually, you know, they're, they're really not involved much with the schools. They'll build schools when asked, or rather their contractors will build them for them. Uh, and they, uh, but the academies largely run the, the senior schools, the uh, secondary schools and, and increasingly primaries too. Um, so that's that's gone. That was another strategically big surface that needed that sort of big big areas, blank canvases to to plan and provide. Highways I've touched on a couple of times. That's that remains a, a major strategic service. You know, it would be very expensive if each district you know, had its own uh, gang of road repairers uh, and was you know sort of collecting its own tarmac adam and putting things right and paving slabs and so on but hang on 
Highways at County Hall is, is done by their contractor, Ringway, um, and just about every county in the country uh, has a contractor on a long, long-term project. Are they about 10 years long? I don't know. We've had Ringway all the time. I've been a county councillor. I remember when it was someone else, Halcrow. Um, so they do change it, but but not not frequently. So really all they're doing with highways at County Hall is, is managing processes that have to happen. Um, and that's actually the, uh, the bane of parish council's life, really, that they want a little problem solving, a gully clearing or a pothole filling and the public's problem, uh, but actually getting to County Hall, to get Ringway, to get to the site and programme the worm in, it proves to be a, a nightmare often. So that too these days is it's, the arguments hardly hang like they used to in the good old days of, of county government. Social care is a, another major service that county councils have been associated with again the uh, you know the director of social services as they were called um, you know was another key figure in the in the hierarchy of county government but these days of course social care is largely happens in the private sector and the local authorities are still responsible for um, looking after people ensuring their care package and funding it to an extent but they're simply buying places mostly in the private sector and, and providing a little bit of specialist social care themselves because the private sector doesn't do it. And then lastly, in the sort of big strategic services, waste management. Now that is one that in a sense the counties uh, hang on to, uh, but hey, wait a minute, that's complicated too because it's the districts or the Worcester City Council that collects the, uh, the refuse and it's the county council that's responsible for disposing of it. Um, and it's a bit more complicated still because the county council's investment in uh, waste disposal is a, such a technical, highly expensive area that they give that to the private sector to, to run to. So we have a Enviro sort plant at, at uh, Norton and we have the incinerator, sorry, the energy from waste plant at Hartlebury. Uh, which are PFI projects and run by Mercia Waste uh, on behalf of the County Council. The County Council, believe it or not, even lent them some money to allow them to complete the plant. Uh, so they've got a financial stake in it, but fundamentally it's Spanish money that is, uh, you know, as it were, funding that, that project. Um, so what is the story I'm telling really is that the old arguments about the need for scale for big areas to be efficient and strategic rather fall away these days when so many of these services have sort of collapsed into much more localized leadership and, and, and governance. So it's the academies, you know, usually mostly localized. I think they're getting bigger, but they've started from very small groups. Um, the uh, housing services are out of the equation largely. Uh, as I say, highways is contracted out and so on. So it's all a very different picture now than the arguments that were around and the, and the sort of logic of, of the Redcliffe Maud city region structure. Perhaps the one exception I'd pick up on that however, um, just to bring this very much home to, to, to Worcester, uh, is housing and planning. Uh, and as, uh, as you all know, I'm sure, uh, Malvern Hills, Worcester City and Witchaven councils have been collaborating in, a, in their land use plan, which includes the sort of housing development. Uh, that's the most important strand of it probably, uh, ever since 2006, um, to do a joint plan. And these days you're really expected to do that, again, to be big and strategic about it. Um, but the irony of the current local structures that we have in, uh, in, in those three counties is Worcester is, is pretty well built out. Uh, so additional housing that Worcester undoubtedly needs for its expanding population and more household formation uh, has to happen in Witchaven or in Malvern Hills. Uh, and that's not very kind on, on, on Worcester because that's the centre that, as it were, will support those communities. But all these housing estates around Worcester 
in Malvern Hills and in Witchhaven's land means that the council tax is paid to Malvern Hills and Witchhaven. So, you know, that's, that's a, a living example on our doorstep of the sort of problem that Redcliffe Maud all those years ago was trying to uh, avoid, you know, so the tax base should support the, uh, you know, the, the services, the public services have to be provided. Um, one other sort of final, final few remarks really before I open it up for you. Um, the, the very big question I suppose that, that has to be put uh, right now is, is this the right time to be embarking on local government reorganisation? How important, how relevant is you know, a, a change in the, in the ways of working and all the, the you know, ephemera that goes with a change because this is statutory stuff. So it's a very legalistic process and it, it would cost a huge amount of money and take a huge amount of time to embark on a reorganisation. Uh, is it the right time, COVID and all that? Um, arguably, I would say the, uh, the government's sort of piecemeal approach, bit by bit since 1986, has actually created ex expectations and, and made us into a, a more complex situation than we, we might have been. In the old days, you had a, a reorganisation in 1869, had one in 1972 and we had a sort of mini one um, a little bit later than that but what we've been doing recently is this sort of bit by bit each year there's a new one pops up somewhere government goes and argues with government a bit like uh, Andy Burnham and uh, the, the, the Chancellor and Boris you know sort of go and negotiate and try and get as good a deal as you can and if you've got local support if your referendum suggests that there's, there's local community support for reorganisation, you, you, you're given the chance to do it. Uh, but that's what sort of created the, uh, the popori picture that we have. Uh, as I say, Scotland and Wales just got on with it in, in one fell swoop. And I think they're, they're looking at England these days and smiling and saying, you know, how sad. Um, the final, final comment is just to repeat what I said early on. Uh, let's not forget about the lowest tier of local government, if I'm going to be hierarchical about it, and that's town and parish government. Uh, uh, Worcester City is a, you know, is, is a wonderful civic centre, uh, the great history and so on. So I would, I would add into the mix those, those city councils uh, as being, you know, having a status in their own right because they are, you know, in significant in a ceremonial sense as well as in a local government sense. Um, and that's true of many town, town councils, you know, who are municipal boroughs and uh, have, a, have a status. But the parish level of government along with those, uh, you know, I think is, is so important. And it's one of certainly been my vision uh, through my career. Uh, and it remains the sadness really. Um, is that we don't give enough attention. We haven't tried hard enough to get good parish level government. As I say, the community councils in Wales and in Scotland you know, are better. Uh, they were set up to do a job uh, and they, uh, you know, they, they, they're voluntary. You don't have to have them, uh, which is good. So you only get them where there's impetus and, and, and you know, sort of citizens who want to make them work, but that's most of Wales is, is covered. Um, but our parish government has, has been quite sad. We've got some excellent examples. It's not all bad, uh, but it, again, it's very mixed. Um, and many parish councils don't meet any more than the, the annual meeting in the year, very rural areas I'm talking about now. Uh, most, by far the most, uh, parish councils don't raise enough candidates to have an election. So their, their membership is usually uncontested. Uh, and, and usually turns into co-option, so you get your friends to, to join you and so on. So there's a, a, a dangerously undemocratic basis. And their, their commitment in, in many cases to really engaging with their communities and being a, a layer of government is, is sadly wanting. Uh, and it, you know, it fascinates me, here I am in West Malvern, which has a parish council, I attend it every month. Um, and, uh, you know, I just don't think the community knows the parish council. Um, 
certainly, you know, thinking of the correspondence I get, the phone calls I get, I know it's because we, we do important things that the parish council doesn't do, like planning application and so on. Um, but, you know, I, th I think parish councils ought to be much stronger in our structured local government. Uh, and they're ripe for, you know, sort of refreshing and... Uh, and I think the key to that is, is giving them some service responsibilities, allotments and cemeteries and the one or two other things, uh, local street lighting that they have got powers for, isn't enough to really engage the community as well as potential councillors. Uh, so let's not forget the parish level as well as thinking about unitary local government. I'll stop there if I may, but delighted to not just answer questions, but have a conversation with you. Thank Dying you. to hear your thoughts. Brilliant. So we'll uh, we'll open the floor up now to uh, questions, and uh, uh, we've got to Nick and then Marjorie. Hi. Yeah. Um, my big concern about unitary authorities is trust from the people they're supposed to be serving. Uh, I was um, a local government officer in Fife when that went unitary at the end of the 1990s. It took certainly 15 years, and to some extent it's probably still there. A feeling, if you live in Kirkcaldy, that all the attention is on Glenrothes, and Cooper, is complete, which is a historic county town, is completely ignored because it doesn't have enough councillors. Yeah. I then worked yeah. in London Borough of Ealing, where there's a very similar tension. Acton feels completely neglected by London Borough of Ealing. Yeah. Greenford yeah. Might, feels it might as well not exist. I, I think that unitary authorities are quite damaging to the relationship between elected members and the population. Yeah, that's great, great point. Those are the good examples of the problem, yeah. And really, really difficult in, in those uh, you know, London borough areas where there are distinct communities within a borough. Um, absolutely right. Yeah, I have less knowledgeable about Fife, but uh, I can relate to your London examples. Yeah. And trust is a, obviously a key, key issue. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, Marjorie, I think you've got a question. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, John, I used to live in Berkshire and, and that was reorganised into unitary authorities in 1998. Yeah. Yeah. And um, one strange thing happened, which was that I believe there was a, an awful lot of um, conspiring and, and, and um, discussions behind the scenes, which allowed Reading to be a unitary authority. And uh, I've just looked it up. The population of Reading is 163,203. And now people are saying a unitary authority should be around 300,000 people. So um, uh, if, 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 if we ever got reorganized in Worcestershire, I'd feel it was unfair. So what happened in, in Reading was that it was the center of Reading. And that means that most of the time it's ruled by the Labour Party. Yeah. But as, as soon as you have a larger one with, with rural areas outside, it's more likely to be ruled by the Conservatives. Yeah. And uh, so yeah. they were lucky in a way, but I don't think it'll, it'll happen now. Am I right? Yeah. Well, I think you are. I mean, that's, that's an example of the point I was making, really, about bidding. Uh, you know, Reading got in uh, with its application when, when this was beginning to be talked about again uh, and mm. got away with it, really. And, and you're absolutely right. It's a very small... Uh, small unitary in comparison with what is recommended these days has been there. But it is actually a very wide range. I think I've seen 50,000 to, you know, 300,000 is, is, is the sort of typical range. It is very wide. Mm. Um, now, whether that's necessarily a problem, you know, automatically a problem that there's a variance in scale or, or if it is, you know, able to adjust the geography, uh, you know, is a mute point. I think you can argue about it. But, you know, Reading is a very constrained area. You know, it's, a, it's an urban area. Um, mm. There's not much more to it, is it? It's a highly populated, densely populated area. Um, mm. Other unitaries, are, you know, are much more a sort of hinterland, you know, Redcliffe Maud style. Um, mm. 
And I, yeah, well, you know, I, I find it messy as a, as a sort of once upon a time geographer. Uh, you know, I, I, th I think that it would be better if there was some sort of consistency in the, in the nation. And that's what Redcliffe Maud offered, but mm. politics got in the way. Mm, I agree. I would like to see some consistency. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, it seems that the centre of gravity when there is changes seem to be that councils go from two tier to unitary. Have there been any examples where it's gone the other way from being a unitary going back to having two tiers? I'm not aware of any. I wouldn't like to say it hasn't happened, but I I, I would imagine it, if it was, it'd be only one or two at most. Um, no, you see, there are other ways of, of making something work better, isn't it, than, than changing the, the geography of, of lines. I, I think when, when unitaries have, uh, um, you know, have, have not been successful, uh, governments sent the commissioners in and sorted out the, the problems, and that's, that's the way it happens in this country, isn't it? Uh, Northamptonshire, for example. Yeah. I've got another question. Um, in the case of Herefordshire, that obviously went into mm -hmm. being a unitary authority. Um, can you comment on why that happened? Uh, uh, yeah. I understand it might have been because they ran out of money. Was that, was that the problem, or can you give a bit, expand a bit more on that? I, I don't know what the official answer should be. Um, of course, remember that uh, once upon a time, we're going now back to Redcliffe Maud time, uh, and certainly 1972, Hereford and Worcester was the county. It was a double county. Um, you know, we forget that. I've got somewhere upstairs a picture of the first Hereford and Worcester County Council. They're all men and they're all looking very serene like a school photograph, but it's quite funny, really, um, just how much has changed in, in my lifetime. Um, but, you know, it, it was Hereford and Worcester together and the, the Worcestershire County Council building was Hereford and Worcester's building to start with. Um, it was built for the, the two. Um, what happened? Um, Herefordshire people never liked being associated with Worcestershire. It was a bit like asking Yorkshire people to join bits of Lancashire and, and so on, I think. Um, so again, government relented to the signals it was hearing, you know, the protests of, of, of the people, if you like. Um, and, and had to sort of separate Herefordshire out um, at some cost. You know, they, they had to take a, a great lump of what was the Malvern Hills District Council, as we were two tier, of course. Uh, so Malvern Hills District geographically is one of the silliest in the country. Uh, you can always pick it out on a map that shows all the constituencies or, or you know, from the air, you know, sort of long distance map because it's a sort of, sort of goes up and then turns sharp left, uh, which is the Tembury wing. Um, there's, there's no sense of a city region or a, you know, a sort of cohesive uh, uh, shape to it because a load of it went with Herefordshire back into, uh, from the, the double county, back into Herefordshire where it belonged, the Bromyard bit I'm talking about. Um, so that's really what, uh, you know, put Herefordshire in, in a position to be a unitary. It was two, there were, there were the, the, the three, there was Hereford City, North Herefordshire and South Herefordshire, weren't there? Um, but they chose to, uh, to come together. It was, a, you know, it, was, it was, came from Hereford, I understand, that they uh, could work as a single authority once they were free from uh, Worcestershire. Um, so I think that's, that's really the sort of, you know the sort of chronology of what happened there. Okay, thank you. Um, and it, and it, it struggled right from the beginning. They, they always blame Worcestershire for keeping too much of the resources, so they got off to a bad start. But it's often said of Herefordshire, it, it struggles financially um, because it's not got a big population base. Um, and you can always, always uh, tell you're in Herefordshire by the condition of the roads, which is a lot worse than Worcestershire's roads. Yes. Um, so I've got uh, Neil Lawrenson next. Hello, Neil. Um, I can't you. see you, but you're there oh, somewhere. Oh, see you not. I'm well, maybe I've got a... Now I've got you all now. Um, thank you very much, John. That was um, very interesting for a local government nerd like me. 
uh, I'm sure for everyone else as well. Um, whilst you were talking about Redcliffe Maud, I couldn't resist uh, looking quickly at Wikipedia. I have got a question, but I just want to share this. Um, I found out that um, uh, Peter Walker was uh, in opposition at the time. Of course, Peter Walker is father of the Worcester's current MP. Yeah. Yeah. And Peter Walker was also um, the first Secretary ever State. environment minister. Yeah, correct. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah no, he was. Yeah, yeah. In yeah, well, the whole world. He, he was the Secretary of State who said no to uh, Redcliffe Maud, really, uh, in the fact yeah, of the government. Well, yeah. according, yeah. according to Wiki, he was a bit more on the fence. But um, anyway, um, local connection there with um, the, the history mm. of local government. Um, the question yeah. I have um, is about um, gerrymandering. Um, it's a bit of a mischievous question, although, you know, well, see what you come up with. But the question is, can you give me an example of a blatant act of gerrymandering uh, in order to win votes for a particular party. I've seen some caucus in America where they gerrymander an area so much that it goes by street and it looks like a piece of Lego. Um, but is there such an example that you could provide from, from England? Um, and obviously I'd like to stash it in my back pocket for the day where I argue against uh, an attempt at gerrymandering in the future. Mm. I can't immediately think of one. I'm not. I'm not a local government sort of nerd, as you put it, uh, in the sense that I don't really collect this up. But I have a, a very good friend. Uh, you may have read some of his stuff. He's, he's he retired about the same time as me from the university. Worked with him, uh, Chris Game, uh, and he still writes a lot for the local newspapers. So stick him in your browser, Chris Game. He writes lovely, uh, you know, lovely pieces. They're all short and very readable, quite funny, but they're all you know, full of anecdotal truisms about local government. Um, he'll find you some, uh, and if not, email him. He'll, he'll, he'll find one for you. Great. Chris Game. Okay, um, I've got uh, Ed Cohen. Hey, Ed. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yes, you're a bit yeah. quiet, but yeah. All right, now well, I'll, I'll get closer to the um, to the computer. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute now. But, thank That's you. better. That's better. Must have pressed that bit of the computer. Uh, thank you, John. Very stimulating. Um, I wanted to raise the issue about representation by councillors. So, at the moment. I think a district councillor will represent two and a half, three thousand voters. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, a county councillor will represent about 10,000 voters. Yeah. Um, and so when you talk about a unitary, I guess that will be somewhere in the middle of that, about six. Now, you know, what is the right level? So I'm looking at this from a completely different point of view what is the right level for representation in order to get good democracy? Well, that's, that's a great question. And, and funnily enough, we've been talking about it at Malvern Hills this very afternoon. Uh, we're, we're, like you at Witchhaven, uh, uh, contemplating getting the Electoral Commission to review our number of councillors. Malvern Hills has 38 councillors. You have 47, is it? Uh, 45. And we're at five. four at the moment because yeah, okay, right. yeah. um, so I'm on a little group that's you know preparing our submission for that and we've been looking at the statistics of councillor representation and so on uh, and it's quite a wide field where we are at the bottom end as you say I think I've got about 1600 in my ward for the district council um, and there are two councillors, we share it, myself and Natalie McVeigh. Wow. So uh, we, we've really only, only got 750 each, uh, if we were to divide the population. But of course, you don't divide the population. We both comment on every planning application. We both respond to constituents because they write to us both. Um, it's all, all fairly silly, I think, double member wards, but that's, a, that's another question. Um, but... 
as you say, at, at county, I look after not just the same area as the district, my, my ward of West, uh, I also look after the next one, which is called Dyson Perrins, which is similarly large, it's slightly larger in fact, so I have uh, 3,200 I think in total uh, uh, constituents, uh, or on the electoral list I should say, um, in, in, in total. Um, and as I said at the meeting today, I actually find that perfectly manageable. I get far more public questions, comments, complaints in relation to county services, and it's pretty well all highways related. That's the thing that generates the vast majority of uh, my workload. I wouldn't necessarily say it's the same for every councillor. Uh, my ward you know, is not one of the most deprived. It's probably one of the most eclectic, but uh, mixed. Um, but, uh, you know, I get comparatively little uh, from the district, uh, you know, other than grumbling about street cleaning and a few other things. Um, but I get a lot more from the county highways. Uh, and so I, I said today, uh, and I feel it genuinely, uh, I know I'm in a privileged job that I, you know, I can sort of adjust my working time. And so I'm more available uh, than many nine to five working people. Um, but I think it is possible to uh, to deal with modern day constituencies with less councillors. Uh, now that could mean less representation, you know, less closeness to the public. But it is the reality. Not that many people contact their councillors these days. A lot of the reporting systems are available online now. Uh, the complaints I get about highways are usually because they have reported it online and nothing ever happened, or at least nothing fast enough for them to be satisfied. So then they phone their councillor and uh, have, a, have a go about it. And I have to then try and battle the machine to get things done. And it's hard and very frustrating too. Um, so I'm not really sure what the answer is, but I, I do think that uh, you know representation is also as long as a piece of string really. I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that some councillors are harder working and go looking for, for work uh, or making work than others. Um, so I think the, you know, the sort of equality of opportunity that's provided by a sort of standard number of voters per councillor, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that there's a standard level of, uh, you know, councillor representation. Uh, and it's the same at meetings too. We, we mostly turn up, but some people are very silent councillors and, and really seem to make, to me, to make relatively little contribution. Others are rather vocal, and even if you don't like what they say, you you know you respect them for their preparedness to challenge and to uh, you know to to get involved, to engage with the process. Well, those are my random thoughts, anyway. But it's a great question. Thank you. What do you think? What's your thought about that? Oh, well, I, I want to make um, uh, democracy as local, you know, to have councillors as close mm. to their um, yeah. as possible. Um, yeah. And I and I wonder, I, I, we won't go there, but I wonder whether we should go back to um, town councils, well, borough councils, mm. you know, there was mm. Needham, yeah. Um, yeah. borough council. Yeah. Um, well, I, as I said, I, I'm passionate about seeing parish councils re-engage, you know, and, and sort of uh, playing a bigger role. But we have to give them more responsibilities for that to work, I think. I would love to see the parish councils being the point of entry for getting highways type things fixed. Uh, and I've said this countless times to my highways people. Uh, they, they scoff at back at me. But, you know, it should be the clerk that's able to to get a contractor to fix a, a problem uh, rather than have to wait for county council to tell Ringway and Ringway to organise their life and bother to wait till they're coming in this direction and doing it. It would be a bit more efficient in the very big picture. But really, the frustration that it creates along the way has a cost, too. So that's my story on that one, that yeah, we'll get yeah, better think... local government. If, if we engage the parishes and get them elected, properly elected, rather than just sort of, you know, co-opted, uh, having some responsibilities and being able to commission jobs to be done. They're not going to have a workforce 
of, of thousands to do things. But as I've shown to you, the county council doesn't have or have that anymore either. Uh, they, they simply you know, buy the services in from people who will do it. And doing it quickly should be part of the, you know, the contract. Okay, yes, thank you. I, I, you know, I, I can see where you're going. And I, I was just thinking that, you know, you could have your parish and town councils and they could operate on the, the combined authority route where they actually yeah. come together as a group in order to buy them yeah. big services. Yeah. And then yeah. they can, uh, you know, directly yeah. liaise with them. Because, yeah. I mean, really, the people at county are just being a post box. You know, you get a complaint in from... Yeah. either district or yeah. town and yeah. they, they have to yeah. pass it on and I, yeah. and I have to say yeah. we have some experience of that being a very inefficient process yeah. yeah yeah spot on the other thing i didn't mention i should have done really um when i was talking about you know how things have changed from the you know, old education and social care and all that uh is there is a lot of partnership working going on these days so we don't have to necessarily reorganize local government to create you know, more efficient, larger, more strategic structures. Uh, waste is a classic example. There are several, not many, but there are several examples of collaborations between adjacent counties. We do have it here in the sense that Hereford has, has remained part of the Worcestershire partnership for waste. So it's Hereford and Worcester for waste. I didn't say that at the time, but I've just remembered, um, but, but for nothing else. Um, but there are you know, Somerset councils, they all share services in a big way. Uh, they do in South Oxfordshire. Um, so, you know, that's another way of working. You get bigness by working, collaborating together rather than structurally reorganising. OK, I think we're, we're slowly, uh, well, we're rapidly running to the end of our time. But I think I've got three people who would like to ask a question still. So if we have perhaps quick questions and quick quick answers, we'll get those through. So I've got Pete, then I've got Neil, and then I've got Nick, and then Tom. So we'll have, let's make them really quick ones then. Oh, and Marjorie as well. Okay, okay, Pete first. Um, yeah, but I'll try to make it a quick question, but it's probably a big subject. It's, it's more on this theme of, of um, not so much what, what the councils do, but what councillors do. So it's, it's any reflections you have, John, or knowledge of, of the difference in terms of, of the way councillors operate and the committee structures and everything between unitary authorities and the type of authority we're in at the, at the moment. And whether in fact perhaps the shift from one or the other gives an opportunity for a good overturn of old systems that aren't working very well on that and that can be improved in that respect anyway. As far as I can see, they haven't really changed at all. The way councils work, you know, all, all my time has, has been the same. They're very much driven by their statute and law. So procedure is all important and it's gone into Zoom. You know, we have our Zoom meetings planning last night, for example, and, and you know, the sort of rituals that we have to go through to, to do the public thing properly, you know, just, just is the way local government has always worked and always will work. Uh, it's a very legalistic process. So no, it doesn't make any, it won't make any difference at all. Okay. I think. Thank you. So I then got, uh, I then got Neil. Uh, you mentioned uh, about the cutting councillors, um, the numbers of councillors, not actually cutting councillors. You're a bit quiet, Neil. Oh, sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, sorry, the headphones are all to the volume. You mentioned uh, cutting the numbers of councillors, which would obviously be a, a very popular move with the public. Um, simple yes or no. Do you, is it genuinely the case, do you think, that um, Conservatives are reluctant to reduce the number of councillors purely for their own selfish concern that they just like being a councillor, they like the allowance that they get? I think probably, yes. I'm not sure I would say it's just, just a conservative phenomenon, but uh, I think there's a lot of that goes on, yeah. I just find it that absolutely bizarre. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I wish we didn't have allowances, but they, it, they are a reality and then no one's going to let go of them. And it is essentially a thing that keeps a lot of, lot of people standing in elections, yeah. sadly. Thank you. Okay, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Um, you quite rightly have pointed out that uh, very many things are now contracted out. Um, 
it appears to me that there's very little expertise in local government to actually write contracts with sufficiently challenging terms to ensure that service delivery of, is of an adequate standard. Have you got any suggestions of how local government at, at any scale can get round that? Gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what do you think? I'm not quite sure what, what you're wanting me to say. Um, it seems to me um, that the approach for the last 20 odd years has been to bring people in from the private sector yeah, yeah, um, yeah. on the grounds that they theoretically have expertise in contracts, um, yeah. which I think it, uh, in its own right could be challenged, but they appear to have no expertise at all uh, in prioritising service delivery. Yeah. Um, I don't see any easy answers. I, I wondered if it was something that you had thought about and had any views on. Well, I, I certainly notice it happening all all the time. I'm on a, currently I'm on a uh, a uh, task and finish scrutiny group looking at energy procurement, Worcestershire's energy, all those streetlights, you know, the, the, the big big contract, m millions of pounds, um, and that apparently Worcestershire. Uh, and a few other authorities formed the West Mercia, not West Mercia, Mercia Energy Company uh, with its own chief executive and staff that are playing the futures market with, of energy, uh, you know, all in a good purpose of trying to save money, I suppose. But uh, as well, Worcestershire County Council has its own large and, and ever expanding procurement team uh, who I, I can't comment on their expertise, but they do have an in-house, you know, team that do procurement. And I just can't understand why we have to outsource procurement for energy, uh, but not for everything else. Uh, it's strange. Uh, local government has its funny ways of working. Some of it must be historic. Some of it must be too complicated for anybody to criticise it. I really don't know. I think you know more about this than me. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you. And uh, Marjorie. Thank you. Do you. John, do you think that the current kind of messy situation um, d d d um, is bad for, vo for voting figures? What I do, what I'm thinking is that uh, because the, s the system is differs so much in different areas, in some areas we've got uh, voting by thirds, electing by thirds, yeah, and other yeah. areas you don't yeah. elect, you elect once every four years. In some areas mm. it's unitaries, in others, you know, very often yeah. on voting day we get people trying to vote in their ward when they haven't got an election. No, yeah. And if, I do yeah. think it would be beneficial if the system was the same throughout the country. Well, I, I do think that, uh, although I've got no grounds for saying that because I've never experienced thirds. I know you have it in Worcester. Um, yeah. but I, it strikes me that four years all in, all out, you know, <laughs> is, is works well <laughs> enough. Um, good riddance to the whole, you know, the whole set sort of thing. But, you know, it's, I think it is just history and, and it's typical mm -hmm. of local governments, you know, clinging on to certain bits of its history and uh, so on. And changing other bits. It's part of the messiness I've been talking about all evening, really. I think it, uh, it's also I would part of the, yeah. yeah. I think, think it's also part of the English character. Yes. You know, yeah. messiness and clinging on to old ways of doing things. I think you're right, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. It's I sweet, think, isn't it? I think we've got time for one last question. I think that was from Tom. Tom, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, John, thanks very much for your time. Really stimulating evening. Um, considering that the response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been so far very centralised, like many other things in, in, in this country at the moment, and the tendency seems to be that Tories want to centralise more things around Westminster so in terms of decision making, what can we learn from other nations in terms of more localised approach to tackling mm. things like public health emergencies? Well, the first thing to say, of course, is we have one of the most centralised local government systems in Europe. Um, you know, they look at France, look at Scandinavia, you know, they have far more local authorities doing far more of the public services uh, and, and doing it rather better. We've 
a lot to learn from other countries, but we're never going to get there. You know, it's, it's endemic to the uh, our centralised British culture, isn't it? Really, is Whitehall and Westminster is where where it, where it happens, and local government is is seen as a very poor neighbour, not just by pol national politicians, but the public. I mean, the turnout at local elections says it all, really, doesn't it? Mm. 30, 40 percent if we're lucky. You know, it's a very sad indictment, really, on uh, you know, the public's commitment to, or, or trust in, in, in their local government. Because we've got some really important services. They're OK, they're short of cash to deliver them as well as they might and, and might wish to. But uh, fundamentally, we don't value local government in this country enough. Thank you. That's absolutely wonderful. And thank you very much, John, for uh, doing this talk and answering those questions. Um, I did uh, take the liberty of um, pressing the record button because uh, to allow other people to see this afterwards. Um, is everyone OK with us putting this on our local party website? If you've got a problem, can you put your hand up? Okay, so that's, that's a yes then, good. Um, so thank you very much. And um, uh, yeah, I think it's quite nice to uh, give a round of, of applause for John and uh, to say thank you and, uh, and good night. So if you'd like to un unmute yourself and uh, be brilliant. Thank you. Thank, thank you all very much. Brilliant, thanks thank John, thanks for doing that. Yeah, thanks John, that was so interesting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. pleasure. Take care everyone. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.